Good morning. My name is Stephen Lang, and I uh, played General George Edward Pickett in the film Gettysburg. Very good. Uh, prior to uh, filming the movie, and this goes back, I believe, to 1993, was when it was released. Was it uh, filmed earlier in 1992? I think 1992, I believe. Okay. Uh, a question to you about horsemanship. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, I believe, a scene in the movie where you're galloping up rather furiously to a group of uh, other officers and your horse slides and almost slips and falls. No, no, no. My horse doesn't almost slip oh. and fall. <laughs> By any means, that's completely inaccurate. My horse, Stormy, who is a beautiful show horse, a great, great movie horse, uh, he read the terrain very, very well. We, we as you say, uh, we galloped in furiously, and basically he kind of slides into third base. But his butt touches for less than a second, and he's up like that. So it's a, it was, um, uh, it's, it's designed, although I can't say it's designed by the rider, it was designed by a very, very, very smart horse. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Now, in terms of horsemanship, had you been riding uh, for many years before you got to the movie? Look, I had a... I've always had a very strong image of myself as a rider, and that can be very, very important uh, as an actor. It kind of fills you with confidence that you probably shouldn't have. But, uh, but I had ridden before, but uh, certainly in the preparation for this film, uh, I spent all day in the saddle every day for, for a number of weeks, and I was riding McClellan saddle, which I'd never ridden before, and also my horse, Stormy, and I were familiarizing uh, ourselves with each other. I had requested, uh, coming into this, to have a rare and horse, which is, because I knew, I knew that when I made the first entrance into this film, I wanted to rare and say, Virginia has arrived. I just sort of decided that because uh, I thought it would be a good piece of showmanship, and indeed it was, Excellent. I think. Excellent. How did a, a young man growing up in New York City end up playing George Pickett? Well, I was, uh, you know, I read The Killer Angels, when it came out, and um, it, it just stirred me. It's a remarkable, remarkably readable book, <laughs> a wonderful book. And right from the start, I had said to myself, I have to play George Pickett someday. And that would probably be in 74 or 75, probably. And then <clears throat> cut to uh, about 17 years later, uh, 92, I was performing Hamlet on Broadway, uh, uh, so I suppose one could equally ask, how does a young fellow from uh, New York City end up playing Hamlet? I mean, look, I became an actor. And, um, and uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Billy Campbell, wonderful actor, was playing Laertes to my Hamlet. And he said to me before a performance one day, he said, oh, I got to be good today because <laughs> there's a guy named Ron Maxwell coming to see it and this guy's directing a film of the Killer Angels and I'm up for the part of Joshua Chamberlain. And I said, no kidding, that's great, man. And I thought, wow, Killer Angels, they're actually doing it. Holy moly. And then I went on because I had to do my performance as Hamlet and kind of forgot about it. But after the show, I was leaving the theater and a man came up to me and put out his hand and said, hello. I'm Ron Maxwell. And it all came back to me, and I just instinctively put out my hand and said, hello, I'm George Pickett. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and, and he kind of <laughs> stepped back, you know, a little bit, looked at me and said, uh, are you free for breakfast tomorrow? And I said, uh-huh. <laughs> and so we met the next day, and we talked. And by the time the, um, it was done, uh, I had been cast as George Pickett. Now, the footnote to this, of course, is that Billy Campbell did not get the role of Joshua Chamberlain. That went, of course, to the great Jeff Daniels. But Billy did play uh, uh, Captain or, uh, Pitzer, who, in fact, gets the only laugh in the movie. It's a legitimately, beautifully earned laugh, uh, in fact. And Billy has gone on to have, of course, a, a, a glorious career. Gosh, what a right. great story, Stephen. It's, true. it's even fantastic. greater because it's true. Yeah. It's completely true. I haven't embellished the story one bit. Okay. What was the audition or screen test like? Uh, I that? didn't do one. You didn't do I one. I think it was Hamlet. I think it was To Be or Not To Be. Okay. Well, that's you know, a pretty good Because, you know, 
-hmm. Ron is a very, very uh, classically oriented, yeah. erudite guy. And uh, I think he probably, you know, figured with it. And also, I had really beautiful, long, curly hair <laughs> at the time. Okay. And that helped, you Sure, know. sure. Have you always had an interest in history? Um, it, it's grown and grown and grown. I think, you know, it's, it's hard to say because my interest really had to do... I, I loved, for example, they died with their boots on. I loved the movies. Mm -hmm. I loved television. So I loved Robin Hood. I, so I loved these adventure things. And so did I love, was it George Custer I loved or was it the mythic kind of film, fil, filmic cinematic mm -hmm. you know, story of him? And the answer is kind of yes to both. Initially, I fell in love with the, with the stories, with the, the, the films, the adventure of it all. But I've come to really, over the years, appreciate the, uh, how minute and how important uh, history is. Well, as long as we're going in that direction, why is Gettysburg important to you? And not just the movie, but also yeah. the, the battlefield in this area, this, this part of the country. Because it, it, it obviously is important to you. You've done so much in this community. You've helped us in the past when we as an organization were fighting to stop uh, the, the construction of casinos sure. here sure. twice. Sure. Uh, and so you've been a great help to sure. us there. So uh, What will your legacy be? Remember okay. that? that oh, was yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Look, there's no place uh, in America that's quite like Gettysburg, what happened here. We, there are so many places that have such significance for uh, both nationally and for, for the community, whether it be Little Bighorn, whether it be uh, the, the, the Washington Monument, or whether it be Saratoga, you, you know, all, all of it is significance. But the magnitude of the tragedy that, that occurred here, and, and, and I really do think it, it is trage mm -hmm. tragedy. And when you speak about tragedy, you talk about there, there's always a sense of inevitability with tragedy. And there was this, what happened here, although we, the historians, we always talk about having it happened by chance, as it were, the two armies stumbled upon each other. I believe it was, you know, absolutely inevitable that, that it happened here. And um, the scope of it, the, uh, just the sheer numbers, uh, themselves, I think, would make it um, would make it significant and uh, somber and reflective. Mm -hmm. But then, what happened six months later, when the greatest president mm -hmm. came here and spoke the greatest words that a president has ever spoken mm -hmm. in in three short minutes? Um, I think that that endowed this place with a symbolism uh, uh, that it will have as long as this nation is in existence. And I think that the existence of this nation, to, to an extent, depends on our own consciousness and recognition of what Abraham Lincoln said here. So I think this is a vitally important place. That's wonderful. It's important for the history. Mm -hmm. It's important for the moment that we live in now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for the future of, of the nation as well to continually interpret mm -hmm. what happened here. My basic feeling is that the Civil War never truly ended. That it still rages today, although it rages on the internet. It rages in, in many, many ways. Thankfully, it's not raging, you know, in the physical mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. to to a large extent, but uh, I don't think we need we should take anything for granted, and uh, I would uh, I think that Gettysburg can serve as a place to work stuff out between us. Seems to me. You're singing from our hymnal, <clears throat> Stephen, in terms of using battlefields like Gettysburg as outdoor classrooms where we can uh, teach and I think even more importantly inspire future generations to constantly strive toward that, as Lincoln said, that more perfect union. Inspiration is exactly right because when you catch kids at a certain age what's really important is 
uh, to inspire, not so much to fill them with facts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, not to test them in any way, but to kind of really open their hearts and their spirits yeah. to, uh, to, 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 what's, uh, to excite them, yeah. to excite, to light their imaginations on fire. And that's, that's, uh, that's what we can do. That's what we need to do. Very good. Beautiful. Back to the movie, uh, just real quick. What was it like working with 5,000 reenactors? Uh, and and it's, it's a movie that couldn't be done. I, I don't know if it could ever be done again, because I don't know if you will ever have that scale at that level of participation for reenactors. Well, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, with where technology has arrived, you actually don't need to have that many participants and you can make it perfectly, perfectly real. I understand that that's, that's a different kind of deal entirely. But, um, but in the, the answer to the question, what's it like to work with that vast number of reenactors? I think we had quite a few more than 5,000 at some point. But uh, 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 all I would say is it's really good to be a general. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, uh, and you know, the, the great thing is, is that, look, on, on some very kind of fundamental level, this whole thing is kind of playing cowboys and Indians for people. I mean, you know, to just address it, to say really truly, <laughs> it's fun to dress up, it's fun to salute, it's fun to fire the weapons, sure. it's fun to ride the horses. And uh, it, uh, there is an aspect that we all have all humans, I think, are born with to pretend, to play. And at some point, we kind of, most people lose it because they have to lose it. Life kind of takes over. One of the things I've always sort of admired about the reenacting community is that they don't really lose it. They really don't. They, they really kind of want to continue it on and everything. And of course, it's fundamental, in a way, to being an actor, that sense of, of pretend, of becoming mm -hmm. something other than yourself and everything. So I've always had a lot of affection okay. for the reenacting community. That's great. Yeah. Uh, actually, during the filming, uh, you said it's great to be a general. Did they treat you like General Pickett? Well, that's the or point. Or they were in character? So, it, it, yeah. it, it, and, and if someone didn't, I might, I might look a bit askance at them, but that really never happened yeah. because they're deep in, yeah. you know? They're, they're the ones, you know, there's an old saying in, in the acting world that you can't act a king, you, it must be acted by those around you. You know, they create the king. And the same would be true for being a, a general, it yeah, seems yeah. to me. And so we all become part of this, um, this dream, sure. this illusion. Yeah. You know, we all contributed to it for a certain amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. What's your favorite part of the movie that you're not in? That I'm not in? Mm -hmm. I don't watch those parts. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Look, I think anything with, uh, with Richard Jordan, I know when Richard does that beautiful speech about where these, where these boys come from, and, they, and the camera just kind of tracks slowly, slowly, slowly across the faces. I think that's very moving, and it's, very, it's particularly moving uh, knowing how that, that Richard was, was was not with us for long after that at all, and how important this project really was to him. So that's a, sentimentally, I would say, okay. uh, something that I love. Um, of course, uh, my gosh, the work, you know, during Pickett's Charge is, is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I know you said things that I'm not participating in, and of course there would be some controversy yes, as to just how much <laughs> Pickett did actually participate in Pickett's Charge. I did through my own kind of research. I decided that, that Pickett was firmly ensconced at the Kadari barn, okay. you know? Don't ask me what my evidence for that is more because I can't remember. Sure. But, <laughs> but I know it was, you know, I was convinced of it and, and, and that's what we shot, but, but okay. he's not really uh, uh, there. It's one of the tragedies of George Pickett's life mm -hmm. is that he ever was promoted to Major General because I think he was a perfectly capable brigadier been a lot of talk over the years about the facial hair in the movie. Was uh -huh. that yours? Yes. All, my, all the hair in this film is my own hair. And, you know, you could pull on it if you want, anytime <laughs> you want, but absolutely that was mine. I was ready to go on, on this movie. There were, there were some hair issues, yeah. and, you know, but uh, not me. There are a couple of those beards you could pull over and go boing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names. Uh, well, uh, uh, could I show you something real quick? 
Um, my dad was a, first of all, he was a history, civics, and social studies teacher for 38 years in middle school. So I got my love of history from him. He actually gave me my first copy of The Killer Angels uh, when I was young. I read it in a weekend. Had never been to Gettysburg before, so I need, knew I needed to get here. But at one of the conventions that he went to, he actually got a photograph, uh, and I'll turn this around for the camera, but it's, it's actually all of you guys. There was originally an inscription to me from uh, Andrew Prine. Right, Andy Prine. That has faded, but... It was Andy Prine. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, uh, let's see, that's Berenger as Long Street, mm -hmm. and, and that's Ivan Kane as Goree, who is an aide to Long Street. That's the great Richard Jordan, I believe, mm -hmm. as Lou Armstead. Uh, that, that's Royce Applegate yeah. as uh, Jim Kempa. <laughs> uh, 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 that's Bo Brinkman, and he was Lee's aide, and I'm trying to, was, I can't remember what happened. I think it was Taylor. Maybe. Yes, it is. It that's Walter, Ta Taylor. Walter Taylor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's my own uh, self as uh, okay. George Pickett, yeah. And I'd heard that Tom Berenger gave everyone swords. Is that your Behringer sword there, do you think? That would or, be, um, or, uh, it, it could well be. I'm not okay. sure if it is. Yeah. I can't remember. The, uh, I just took the Behringer sword out recently and give it, a good, give it a good shine. And I believe I'm going to give it to the collection of uh, my friend J.J. Pinkerton, who is sort of the custodian of things okay. as I, you know, as Very I begin good. to divest myself of okay. all my own relics. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, do people ever come up to you and ask you to do lines from the movie? Yeah, but from this one, there's only one line they ask for. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Could we ask you to do it? Sure. <laughs> I mean, I know it's your craft, and I don't want to... No worries. Make no, it no. Okay. I don't think I'll do it very well, but it's... Uh, it's uh, I mean, ask me, if to ask me to reform my division. Okay. General Pickett, reform your division. General Lee... I have no division. Makes me want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> and if you notice in the film when I do it, I'm actually holding a flower. The filming of it, you know, it starts as a somewhat longer shot, it's, and then it racks. Well, right I think it's the only. I think it's the only time that he racks focus that yeah. way in the film. Yeah. I know in some of the action sequences, the camera is always on the move and everything like that. Right. But in drama, I think it's the only push yeah. that he does. So, so he, so I was helped immeasurably by Ron Maxwell and uh, Keith Va Case Van uh, Nostrum, uh, uh, the camera, our Very cinematographer good. on that one for sure. Wow. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I remember the campfire scene uh, where, which comes after my initial entrance. Uh, Virginia has arrived, and everything, and we're all around the campfire. With it's myself and the brigadiers and and uh, uh, Longstreet's there, and we do that kind of wonderful dialogue that ends with, you know, I, 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 you know, I, well, it is possible that you are descended from an ape, right. and I suppose it's even possible that I am descended from an ape, but there is no way that, <laughs> that General Lee could be descended from an ape. And, <laughs> and everybody agrees. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of, we had a good time doing it, yeah. seeing that, that, and the a ape thing, was that was all improv. I, impro I did improvise oh, that completely. And I remember Jordan came up to me after Richard Jordan came and said, that was good, man. That was good. You know, he just he got a tremendous kick out of it. Uh, uh, so those scenes were kind of a just a delight to do because Shara wrote good dialogue, mm -hmm. Maxwell wrote good dialogue, we tweaked good dialogue. Uh, it was fun. Mm -hmm. So it's not only a big kind of action epic. There's a whole literary side to this film that I mm -hmm. I love. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also say that, gosh, watching watching the work that. Uh, that Jeff Daniels did in the film, and that Sam did, and, mm -hmm. and Tommy Howe mm -hmm. did, and Kevin Conway did in the film, the, the guys who represented the union. Because I think it's, I think it's not unfair to say that so much of the kind of, you know, the glory and the kind of sugar in this film goes to the Confederates, mm -hmm. you know, rightly or wrongly. And I would say, if this were written now, it would be a different story entirely. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, um, but man, they're great 
friggin' uh, uh, Daniels is just great, and Sam, you know, is a kid, beat him, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, so their stuff, I love watching their stuff as well. Uh, and, and then for me, of course, all the horse work I enjoyed doing. I always enjoy doing, when you have a, a, a mechanical task or, you know, an actual physical task to do, whether it be riding or fighting, uh, it takes your mind off the acting. You know what I mean? Very Which good. is a good thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, w I always like that, and I tend, to gen uh, t I tend to kind of view the success of a particular scene as to how well I sat my horse, you know. Very always good. looking to make sure my heels were down or whatever, <laughs> whatever it might be. So, so there's that. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, the, uh, there's a scene where I come, I think you will uh, rem remember old Virginia. Where I come riding and doing remember old Virginia. I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. This is a true story. That um, when uh, you know when that happened and that happened, mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't ride. Pickett came walking out. He mm -hmm. walked out in front of the tree line and turned, and the men were there, and he addressed them. And so probably, you know, a hundred guys to his right and a hundred guys to his left heard him, and the other guys going, "What did he say?" <laughs> you know. But what I said was to Ron Maxwell, I said, um, look, I don't want to walk out there and say this. I want to ride out there and say this. And Ron said, but that's not what he did. That's not what happened. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but that's what should have happened. <laughs> and he was like, okay, okay. okay. Because you examine the moment. Right. And you say, am I do when I do this, what am I doing with history? Mm -hmm. You're not altering it in one iota there, and, and you're doing something that's cinematically sound right. to me. <laughs> but the interesting thing is this. Of course, things are being photographed and filmed and everything like that, and the moment was photographed, and the, there's a photograph of me kind of, you know, going like that as I'm riding stormy. And the photograph was gotten a hold of by, uh, uh, I think it was Mort Kunstler, could have been Dale Gallen, but I think it was Mort Kunstler. And he, uh, he turned it into a painting. Okay. And the painting was called Remember Old Virginia. Mm -hmm. And what he did, that so, and of course they turned it into prints that they sell in all the shops. And what he did that was sort of so canny was he identified all the units and the commanders, because there's all these guys who are there in the picture, you know, mm -hmm. cheering pick it on, he specifically said who they were. So what he did when he did that was he gave it a historical mm -hmm. veracity mm -hmm. that, com that just does not exist. <laughs> but such is the way mm -hmm. history gets, uh, does get written. It comes under that rubric of uh, print the legend, right. you know, and, and in that case they printed the legend. That's wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic. If George Pickett were alive, he'd probably remember riding I'm out sure there. He would. <laughs> I'm sure he would. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's, that, those are moments that I remember. Every movie you shoot is different from another movie. It is true that I did, I did uh, uh, Gettysburg, I did within uh, the next year, probably was uh, down in uh, Arizona shooting uh, Tombstone. And, wow. and those two movies have a couple actors in common. I was in them, Sam. Elliot is in them, and of course we're on opposite sides in both films, you know. He's on the bad side in both films, you know. <laughs> He's a erp, and I'm a, I'm a Clanton, of course. But of course, of course, the great Buck Taylor is in both, uh, both films as well, and that should never be uh, forgotten. And then I furthermore did another film with Buck. We did uh, Gods and Generals together as, mm -hmm. as, as well. Um, and uh, so, I mean, that, that, that's a sort of a common thread between the two films, for me, personally speaking. Uh, there's a lot of horse work in both uh, Tombstone and Gettysburg, although, I'm, as I say, I was riding a McClellan in the one, and I'm, I'm riding a, you know, a Western saddle in the other, which is equivalent to a big old easy chair, you know. Uh, and, um, <laughs> and I was, uh, I was playing an altogether raggedy ass guy in uh, in um, in Tombstone, and I I always say that people always say, "What do you remember about Tombstone?" And I always say, "I can't remember anything. I'm drunk the whole time." <laughs> so it's kind of gone around that I was drunk the entire time that I did Tombstone, and it's not quite you know. It's just uh, you know I'm a big liar when it comes. To, I just made that up, but I did drink a lot. I'll say that. <laughs> I will say that. Um, 
But uh, the two are, uh, let's see, it, there would be a 20-year time, approximately a 20-year time difference between the two films in, in sure. our history. Mm -hmm. uh, and in its own way, in its own way, what happened at the OK Corral is uh, always had great significance as well because it's, I don't think there's any, any event in uh, American history uh, that, has been more, that has been filmed more often uh, than the gunfight at the OK Corral. I, I'm probably wrong about that, but it's certainly in the top, you know, few. I can't dispute you. And everything, and, and ours is extremely accurate. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, aside from those kind of things, it represents a really wonderful period in my life when I was on horseback a lot and I was participating in the kind of films that I'd always wanted to participate in. And so that kind of, um, that, that says, you know, that to me is the, the great kind of uh, conjunction of, yeah. the, of the two. Did you keep any part of the uniform? I kept it. I kept a, 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 a kind of a full a uniform. I have no picket stuff left that I know of, okay. uh, just because I've con I, I've donated all to, as I say, my uh, the guy who collects the stuff okay. uh, is is John John Pinkerton, and uh, I think he does a really good job of it. And I'm, you feel like the stuff is in is is in kind of good hands. I'm not a collector by by nature, you know. Uh, the only thing that I probably have and I'll keep is I have my I. Clanton hat because I think that's kind of an iconic, you know, I think I could probably get a, at least, you know, $9 on eBay for that hat <laughs> should, I ever, should it ever become necessary. Yeah. Uh, but um, I remember wearing the, the uniforms uh, um, were, uh, of course, you, you, you're aware of the heavy wool and, mm -hmm. and what it's like, but, you, you know, you kind of get used to it. And um, the one thing that I, I always feel is that I, I would have liked to have dirtied up a little bit more than maybe I did. When I look at it, sometimes I feel a little... And you think you are, because they're coming around, they're giving you the whack with the, the, the dust and everything like that. But uh, I don't know. I think, I think that with Pickett, you can make a kind of a case for the fact that, you know, he was kind of pristine as most of the time. But, uh, you know, I, I always think a little bit of dirt helps, you know. Sure. If you did hang out at night during the filming of Gettysburg, where did you hang out? The uh, Officers Club for the Army of Northern Virginia was the back room at the Farnsworth House. Ah, okay. That was a, that we did frequent that bar uh, quite a lot. The other place, and I can't say I hung out here, but I did several times uh, venture down to the reenactment camp because that's a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You make mm -hmm. friends that way, you create, it's good for morale, mm -hmm. as it were. And, uh, uh, and again, it sort of speaks to a question you asked before about the relationship between myself and the reenactors. You go down there and word gets out that General Pickett, General Pickett's on the, on the property, General Pickett's around, and everybody's addressing you as General Pickett. Nobody's saying, you know, maybe one out of, you know, 30 guys will say, hey, Stephen, mm -hmm. you know, but most people will be General Pickett, General Okay. Stephen, do you have any Civil War ancestors or other connection directly to the Civil War? I don't. My no. people all came uh, in the early 20th century. I think, well, my maternal grandfather, that family got here in the late 19th century. Okay. But we're all from uh, either uh, Hungary or Ireland. Uh, and, um, and, we, and we got here early. Our stories are different or, you know, you know what I mean, our origin stories are different and, and, and probably our civil wars are different as well, mm -hmm. you know. Do people ever come up to you and say, hey, I had an ancestor in Pickett's division? Sure, sure. Okay. I mean, I get a lot of that. I get a lot of, I, I get, particularly when I'm around Gettysburg, obviously, you get, you, you get a lot of, um, well, it comes out as gratitude, but, mm -hmm. but it's really a recognition of that it's an affirmation for me, that what we did had significance for people beyond the fact that it's a wonderful entertainment. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. But that it actually has some significance. I was speaking, a corrections officer from New Jersey came up to me last night and he, and he was a big dude, you know, with kind of a mohawk and, you know, looked, <laughs> I didn't know what he wanted, you know. And he wanted to tell me that his father had turned him on to Stonewall Jackson, so I'm moving into another film here for a second. Yeah. And that, it, that, that everything I did as Stonewall Jackson was exactly what his father had 
um, you know, told him about Jackson and, and how important it was to him. And, and he was really v very emotional about it, you know. And, and, uh, and it, was, it was nice to know that you have that kind of a, you know, that you can really touch someone's heart that way a little bit. Yeah, for okay. sure. Well, here's one more crazy person coming up to you saying that I had an ancestor in Pickett's Charge. And it's my great-great-grandfather, oh who was 21 years old uh, on this day, uh, 160 years ago. His name is John Thomas Sladen. He was a second lieutenant in the 57th Virginia. Um, 57th was pretty much destroyed that day. Um, he was sent back home to Southside Virginia on duty arresting deserters, which I always thought was a terrible duty until I, I walked Pickett's Charge for the first time many, many years ago and thought that someone who saw his, his friends, his relatives fall beside him during that charge, he might have been highly motivated to find those deserters and get them back into service. So mm -hmm. he, somehow he survived, um, survived through the end of the war, was put into the lines at Petersburg and was captured at Dinwiddie Courthouse took the oath and went back home to Southside Virginia to be a farmer, and got married and had a bunch of kids. So, um, but uh, he was actually there on that day uh, in Armistad's brigade, Pickett's division. And how, how long a life did he live? He actually didn't live terribly long. Uh, he, he only made it into his, I think, early 60s. Um, but uh, I'm very glad he was able to survive on July 3rd, 1863, or else I, I might not be sitting here. Did he make it back to the reunion in 1913? Uh, I have no record. Uh, he, you know, he didn't write anything about his war experiences. You know, I would, uh, just to, to kind of, uh, I don't know, put a coda on things, um, to me Gettysburg over the years has come to be divided into three parts for me, and certainly the the first, second, and third of July is the first part, the battle itself. And then the second part occurs on November 19th when mm -hmm. President Lincoln come and sp comes and speaks what he, his words. And then in July of 1913, mm -hmm. 50 years after the fact, mm -hmm. when thousands and thousands of veterans uh, of Gettysburg and also I believe probably of other battles uh, uh, gathered here in Gettysburg in what was uh, billed as a, a grand reunion, mm -hmm. which I think was supposed to be uh, a, a great reconciliation, mm -hmm. which uh, I don't think it actually was, but it at least ha aspired to be such. And um, I think that story is, uh, is also part of the significance uh, of Gettysburg as well. And that, that's, that's a story that I still would love to tell, in yeah. fact. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that one. Wonderful. I love the photograph of the, the veterans shaking hands over the wall. Well, uh, yeah. they're a film. You've seen the oh, silent films of them as they kind of do, yeah. <laughs> rush at each other, yeah. you know, wielding their canes yeah. and everything. <laughs> and you know, a couple of those guys would really like to bring those canes mm -hmm. right down on the heads of those I'm other sure they <laughs> would. Of the enemy, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think that the significance of we preserving these places. Look, it sounds like a soundbite to say to understand where you're going, you need to understand where you've been. But it does, it just happens, I think, you know, to be true. We can't, you can't be floating, uh, you know, with no past. You can't, you, you, you need to be anchored to events. That's how we develop. That's how we civilize ours, ourselves, it seems to me. And, um, and also, look, one of the great values of being an actor is that you are in a way a storyteller. And I'm a great believer in stories. I think that stories are as vital as bread or salt or fire. Uh, I think that we, we, I think it's what, I think it's what lights us through the night, you know, the stories. And the, the stories that, the story of Gettysburg, the stories of uh, Chickamauga, the stories of uh, Shiloh or Fort Donaldson or any of these stories. They're, um, they warm us. I mean, they help us. They enlighten us. Uh, you, you know, they ground us. I think that may be the most important thing that they can do is they really, really ground us. You know, people, when events happen, 
now and you always have somebody say, I know you're upset about this, but I think you can take solace in the fact that this is not the first time that this has happened. We've been through this before. I don't think anybody actually takes solace in that at all. You, you know, yeah. nevertheless, mm -hmm. it really is important uh, that we do note that. And also, presumably, we can learn mm -hmm. from that as well, even though we don't. But I'll tell you what, if we don't know it, if we don't teach it, then there's no way we're going to learn from it or be able to correct it or improve mm -hmm. upon it. You want to learn something about the country? Come here mm -hmm. and spend time understanding it. Mm -hmm. I think. Anyway. And then hopefully everyone who does that will come away better citizens. Hopefully. I mean, that's, that's, that that's really the is the object. The that objective, is the isn't it, to, to, make, to make good citizens. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. To pull together, yeah. even when we got differences, and we are we should have differences. That's mm -hmm. what democracy is a discussion. It's an ongoing discussion, yeah. it seems to me. And, and, and differences are great, but uh, the way that uh, we've become entrenched uh, in our thinking and not listening and everything, is not, it's just not, it's not useful. Stephen, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it's been wonderful meeting you and getting a chance to talk to you about this uh, incredible film that you were a part of, and uh, also your thoughts about uh, preservation and the importance of history education. So thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to revisit uh, a very, very uh, wonderful time in, in, in my career. Very thank good. you. Thank you, sir.